Uh, good afternoon, sir. Can you see and hear me? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Ruffin. Can we uh, turn to your role as the designated prosecuting authority, sometimes called the prosecuting authority, prosecution authority, or DPA, in the papers? You tell us in your witness statement that you believe that it was the business policy to prosecute um, and you would authorise prosecutions if legal services advised that the post office um, might be successful. Um, can you help us uh, with what you mean by it was the business's policy to prosecute? Um, from the time I joined POID in 1992, I was always led to understand that where a crime was committed against the post office, uh, if it was within the guidelines to prosecute, then the post office would, would prosecute. And what do you mean by within the guidelines? So uh, I probably didn't know at 1992, but later on in my career I understood how legal services would um, consider their advice, um, and I believe they followed. I didn't know at the time, I don't think, but from looking at things since, they followed the same code as the Crown prosecutors. Uh, when you um, uh, became more senior yes. in the position um, in 2002 to 2007 in particular, um, did you have an understanding of how the Code for Crown Prosecutors worked? Uh, I would say yes, um, pro but probably not to the, to the level that you guys do. Um, can we explore the... Uh, space in between those two possibilities. Um, did you have a copy of it? No. Um, did you ever have a copy of it? No. Um, did you ever receive any um, training on uh, making prosecutorial decisions? Um, I don't know if there was any formal training. Um, I probably had a session with either Rob... Uh, and Rob Wilson. Yeah, sorry. Um, and maybe Phil Gerrish, because he did it before me. Um, I don't think there was a formal training. It, you tell us in your witness statement at um, paragraph 48 that um, in order to approve a prosecution, you would have had to have read the case file and the advice from legal services. Yes. Having read the case file and the advice from legal services, what criteria did you apply when authorising a decision to prosecute or making a decision to prosecute? So it was probably very basic. So I would read the case file, the tape summary, and look at the evidence um, from an investigator's perspective, and then read the, the lawyer's advice. Um, and I would only challenge it if I thought that they were prosecuting and I wasn't sure they should or they were suggesting charges other than what I thought. Um, and it would, more, it would more be a case around um, if they were recommending theft and false accounting or just false accounting and I thought they should, they should be pursuing theft, I might have a conversation with us, the lawyer to establish why. Why would you um, think that theft ought to be pursued in addition to false accounting? Well, if, if the case papers to me as an investigator suggested that, that theft was, um, was, a, was a charge that we might apply, then I might ring the solicitor and ask why not. Um, but uh, ordinarily, if they explained to me the reasons, then I would uh, authorise what they suggested. That's um, looking at um, adding a charge or charges. Yes. Um, what about the other way around? Um, on what basis would you decide not to authorise a prosecution? Um, I, I, don't, I don't recall ever not authorising a prosecution. That was my was, next question. Did you ever say no? I don't recall ever saying no. They, they were the experts and they would give the advice. Did they advise on both evidential sufficiency and public interest? For my recollection, yes. But what was the purpose of your um, involvement? Uh, legal services were independent of the business and the decision to prosecute needed to come from the business. It is my understanding of why it came from us. Uh, would you consider um, interview summaries or transcripts when authorising 
prosecutions? Yes. Uh, would you or did you ever raise uh, questions about obtaining additional evidence, having read such interview summaries or transcripts? Uh, I don't. I don't recall. I, I think once the case had come through the casework team, it, the prosecution was very much a matter between the lawyer and the investigator and counsel if and when they came on board. And so you viewed it as a complete package, is, is that right? Yeah. It wasn't your job to start suggesting additional inquiries or not, uh, not, similar? Not in those cases. When I was the investigation manager, if I had an investigator that I was looking at a case, particularly a more junior investigator, if I was looking at their case before it went in, then I might suggest further inquiries or further witness statements. But once it came for prosecution authority, my role was to authorise the prosecution and leave the experts to get on with it. Can we look, please, at um, poll 3048207? Um, this is an email that you sent on the 17th of October 2006 to... Uh, I think that's a generic email account, isn't it? Uh, investigation that's the team. Case, that's the casework team. That, that's the whole of the casework team's email account, essentially. Yes. yes. Um, read Dam Authority for Josephine Hamilton. And you say, prosecution, please. Yes. Did you um, prepare a report or document or pricey of your analysis of the evidence? No. Would you simply convey the outcome of your decision over email like this? Ordinarily, no, I would write in the case papers. I believe this would have been a situation where I wasn't in the office, and so they emailed me. They possibly rang me as well if they needed it done, if I'd been away from the office for a couple of days, and I would simply have replied to the email which is why it says re, because I think this was a reply to an email. And so th the substance of your decision is conveyed in these two words, prosecution please? Simply yes. And if you wrote something in the case papers, it would be similar? I would Prosecution or prosecution approved or? Authorised, something like prosecution that. Prosecution authorised. Yeah. yeah. Does that reflect the fact that you were essentially a rubber stamp? Um, it's a very simple, simple way of putting it. I, I wouldn't see it quite like that because if I was simply a rubber stamp, then I wouldn't re have read all the case papers. Um, I would have just said, yeah, get on with it. But that's not how it worked. You've told us that you conveyed the outcome in one or two words and that you never said no. Um, sounds like a rubber stamp. It does. It, I'm not going to argue that it sounds like a rubber stamp. I, don't, I didn't see it that way. Why didn't you see it that way? Because I was being asked to look at the case papers and agree that what uh, legal service was advising was the correct way to, to go. You were reliant on the... Um, summary of the investigation carried out by the investigator in the offender report? Uh, alongside the taped summaries and the evidence and the advice of legal services. In what circumstances would you be in possession of a full interview transcript? Uh, at the point of prosecution authority, unless the case had gone to legal services and they declined to advise until they'd seen a full ta transcript of interview, um, I would never see a transcript. Uh, was it rare that a full transcript was prepared? Yes. And why was that? Um, was that cost? It was probably cost, effort, 
the time it would take. Um, we had strict timescales on which, in which people had to submit papers. Um, I think from the time I joined investigations, we'd always done tape summaries and transcripts were only prepared if uh, council asked for them. I think we've shown you a series of, that can come down, thank you, a series of interview transcripts from the criminal case studies um, uh, that we some, have. Yes. Um, Adadeo, Thomas, Skinner, and Blakey, just referring um, to them with no disrespect by their surnames. I think I've seen tape summaries and expert excerpts of verbatim. I'm not sure if I've seen full transcripts of all their interviews. Let, let's just look at, um, at one of them. Um, Blakey, please. Can we start by poll 304 4830? And if we just scroll through this, we'll see that it's um, largely a, um, a transcript, albeit breaks into summary in places. If we just scroll and you'll get the the idea of it. Keep scrolling. You can see it's a pretty full transcript. Oh yes, yes. Okay, and if we just go back to page one, please. We can see this is an interview of um, David Blakey, conducted by Paul Whitaker uh, with Helen Dickinson um, present, and indeed she asked some questions yeah. too of the 13th of May 2004. I think this is one of the cases in which you were a decision maker. Uh, probably, if it's in the bundles, yes. Um, and uh, Paul Whitaker, um, presumably you knew him, he was one of your team. He was in one of the investigation teams. I think he was the uh, North of England team. And um, have you read, uh, uh, appreciating that like me, you've got three bundles of papers. Have you read this um, recently? Um, I think I probably read this the middle of October when I first got it, when I was writing my witness statement. But I read all these documents then, so my recollection is not going to be fantastic. Uh, can we um, pick it up? And I'll try and remind you without going through it laboriously, because we've um, already looked at this with Mr. Um, Whitaker. Um, bottom of page four, please. Um, Mr. Blakey says, last line, about three months ago, money started to go over the page. Missing. I covered this up, hoping to replace it. My wife had been ill. I can go into more detail about that later on if you wish. I've got an appointment with the bank manager next week. I was hopefully going to take out a loan to replace it, etc. cetera. Um, and then middle of the page, there's a summary rather than a transcript. DB states the figure seems to accumulate. He states that when they took uh, over the office some time ago, they suffered a few big discrepancies, which he put down to someone unsavory working for him. Uh, Mr. Blakey states that his wife suffers from asthma and whilst the office was suffering the big discrepancies a few years ago, she was worrying. Some of those discrepancies came back through error notices, some did not. Mr. Blakey states he replaced the money and everything was above board, but it did not stop his wife from being ill. Mr. Blakey states that when the losses appeared in the account more recently, he tried to protect her by not telling her. The last thing he wanted was for her to be that ill again. Mr. Blakey states that before he knew where he was, the amount had just built up and built up to where it is today. And Mr. Blakey states he should have told someone in the early days. And then at Mr. Whitaker, bottom of the page, about five or six lines up. Um, in relation to this money going missing, where do you think it's gone? I honestly don't know. Goodness knows. I wish I did. Do you think it's a member of staff, of your staff, that's stealing? No. I'll be absolutely honest. I trust the staff 100%. And over the page, please. He says he can't point the finger at any member of staff and say she won't make mistakes. 
and then Mr. Whitaker says, um, about 12 lines in, I don't think you're telling me the truth there, are you, David? He says, well, and then is interrupted. I don't think you're telling me the truth. It's some time ago, to be honest with you. Not particularly about that. You know where the money's gone because you've been taking it, haven't you, David? Uh, no way, honestly, as God is my witness. Mr. Whitaker, so you're saying that £60,000 has gone in a matter of months and you've not drawn it to the attention of anyone, but not even your wife. Yes, that's true. For we know that's true. Um, but that's not true. You don't run a business like that, David. No, I know you don't, but uh, Mr. Whitaker interrupts. Uh, now, come on. I accept your candidness in relation to you've come in here and you've said, yeah, you've held your hands up to say that the money's gone and you've been, you've been covering up to replace it. But you cannot sit here and expect me to believe that you don't know where £60,000 has gone. And then over the page, please. Third line, Mr. Whitaker, it doesn't disappear. Money goes out of an office through incompetence or dishonesty. And then when he next speaks, now if your staff are incompetent, you get them together and say, pull your bloody socks up. Or if they're dishonest, you get them together and say, one of you is having this money away. Or you get onto the police or it's sorted out that way. That's not happened here. You know where this money's gone because you're the one who's been taking it, David, aren't you? And he says, no, again. Then foot of the page. A bit further down. I can under last um, section, I can understand you've probably got your wife's welfare at heart, but the size of the climb in respect of this, you can't expect me to believe that you didn't know or you didn't do something about it. If it's not you, if it's not you that's doing it, you've got no reason to shield anyone from it. I can understand for health reasons your wife, but you can't shield this from your staff because if it's not you stealing and you don't suspect your wife, then it's got to be your staff. Over the page, please. Uh, third section, I know I'm right, says Mr Whitaker, because I know. David, I uh, don't know what you're trying to, your reasons for doing it or whether you're helping anyone or think you're shielding anyone by not telling the truth, but you're not telling me the truth, David. You can't sit here and expect me to believe you. And then scroll down, please. Um, fourth section from the bottom. Is it something that your wife doesn't know about? I mean, we turn up on a Thursday morning, a lot of places, sub post offices, and the stories we've heard, you wouldn't believe a lot of them. But I know people get in trouble with various things, with gambling. And he says, oh no. Mr. Whitaker continues, things that their wives or their husbands don't know about, secret lives, secret mistresses, and continues, um, PW at the bottom, Mr. Whitaker explains, it's not only him and Miss Dickinson that he has to convince. So that's the interviewer telling the suspect that it's his duty to convince them. And then he reads the caution again. Uh, over the page, please, to page nine. Uh, halfway down. Uh, you know where this money's gone, says Mr. Whitaker. I really don't. I don't know where it's gone. I really wish I did. I wish I could lay my hands on it now and go through to my wife and say, here you are, love. Think about what you're saying, David. Think about what you're saying. If we're to believe that you don't know where this money is, and if we're to believe you, that, that you hadn't had it, how many other people work here? There's the four ladies and your wife. And then um, foot of the page, about ten lines up. Now, if you... What you're saying is true because we don't think it's errors, perhaps, because the error would come back. So we're looking at these four ladies. You've just said, well, you said at the start of the interview, you think they're as honest as the day is long. He says, yes, I do. And then the foot of the page. And the thing is, we've got to speak to these four ladies, possibly. And we've got to question the honesty and integrity of these four ladies. Now, are we to do over the page that? because that's the only option that I can see. You're gonna to have to put these four ladies, we're gonna to have to sit them down and interview them, because from what you're saying, that's our only option. He says, yes. And Mr. Whitaker says, because we want to know who's stolen our money. And then uh, at the end of the uh, next section, 
Mr Whitaker states that he feels the discrepancy, discrepancies are down to dishonesty and that to be thorough he may have to see all members of staff, including Mr Blakey's wife. However, Mr Whitaker states he feels this can be avoided as he feels that Mr Blakey has something he may wish to tell Mr Whitaker. He says, David, money doesn't go missing like that. It doesn't go missing. I've been doing this job a number of years and it doesn't go missing. Somebody takes it. And I don't know whether you think it's better that you'll admit to the covering up to the false accounting or the covering up of it and it will be all right as long as you don't admit to the stealing. That's not the case. And then the uh, last page, page 11, over the page, bottom part of the page, the big section, Mr Whitaker says, and I just don't think it's true. I think you've had it. I think you've had the money. I think it started, I'll tell you, I think it started a number of years ago and you've had a drip, 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 a bit here and a bit there. And it's come to today when the auditors have turned up because you haven't had an audit here for a number of years. I don't know whether you thought, well, I'm never going to get one or what, but the auditor has turned up today and you thought, I've been caught, that's me done. You've um, had to think about it. And though, well, if I say I covered it up, it will be all right. Uh, nothing will happen. That's what I think has happened. That can come down, thank you. Uh, do you agree that this interviewing approach is for the interviewer to offer their subjective to belief as to whether Mr Blakey is telling the truth? I think it's a tactic that's employed in an investigative interview. Um, if, if I had an investigator who was conducting a tape recorded interview with a suspected thief and they didn't accuse them of being a thief during the interview, I'd probably be disappointed in them. Um, I'm I, I wasn't talking about um, uh, accusing somebody of stealing. Right. I was um, asking about the um, repetitive statement of the subjective belief of the interviewer on whether or not the person's telling the truth or not. Um, I think it would depend on the situation on the day and the feel that the interviewer got for the person sitting in front of them and whether they thought they were telling the truth or not. So you think that's okay? Uh, without sitting down and reading the whole thing again in context, then I, I don't see anything massively wrong with that interview. Do you agree that the second thing that the interviewer does is to threaten Mr Blakey with the need to interview his ill wife? Which procedure could be saved if he only admitted the theft himself? Um, I think it could be put better, um, but I think, I think sometimes you need to be clear with the person you're talking to what the next steps will, are going to be. Um, I don't think there's any, any value in concealing from them what the extent of the investigation is likely to be. There's so nothing wrong in that? I'm, I'm not sure of the context, but it's, it's a long time since I did this. I, I, reading it now, I, I'm not sure there's, there's much wrong with that approach. Thirdly, would you agree that the interviewer um, threatened Mr Blakey with the need to interview the four ladies that worked at the branch? to put them through it, as he said, which could be avoided if only he admitted to the theft. So, again, I, I think the way he's put it could be done better. I think it, should, it would have to be made clear that the other ladies would be interviewed, but I'm not, sure, I'm not sure if he intended it to be a threat. I think he was just laying out what the next stages of the investigation would be, but obviously it's, 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 it's up to perception from the person reading it. Fifthly, would you agree that um, uh, Mr Whittaker uh, speculates that Mr Blakey was saving the money that he stole for a retirement plan to look after a mistress I'm not or similar? I, I'm, the, I, I'm not sure why he mentioned that, why somebody had done something or suggesting things like that probably is probably not the most professional approach. Would you agree that, um, sixthly, he... Uh, Mr Whitaker was seeking to badger or hector Mr Blakey into making an admission? Um, badger and hector I, I'll probably disagree with, but um, yes, he was definitely exerting pressure. Again, um, on the appropriate side of the line then, in your, in your view? I would say so, yes. And so if you read this at the time, you wouldn't think, ouch, 
No, I don't think so. Did you ever receive any complaints regarding investigators in interviewing or questioning technique? Um, I.e. being oppressive in an interview? I don't, I don't believe so. Um, every investigator approaches their interview in a slightly different way. Uh, we were all trained in cognitive interviewing techniques and one of the techniques that we were supposed to employ was to try and get the person on side. So having an antagonistic approach in an interview is, is a sure shy way of getting the shutters drawn down. Um, so it wasn't the approach I would have taken, but, but some people got results in different ways. Are you saying by that that it was a, you operated a broad church and that uh, a variety of styles were permissible, including this one? Yes, I would say so. Every investigator had their own personality and their own way of doing things. And they could bring their own personality um, to bear a, onto a subject as, in interview? As long as they stayed within policy guidelines and the law, yes. What were the policy guidelines on interviewing suspects? Um, that all the evidence should be covered. Uh, obviously, I've, I've just explained, we were trained in interview techniques. Um, badgering, obviously, was something that was frowned upon. Uh, if, if somebody did go over the line and it was brought to our attention, uh, and, I, and I expect that to come out either through the solicitor in the case or when the case went to court, because defence would obviously have a view on it, uh, then it would come back and it would, would need to be looked at. But I don't recall ever having any of those cases come back. It, by that last answer, are you saying are you, wait, you would wait for complaint to be made in the course of court proceedings as the judge of whether interviewers were? If, if, I, if I saw inappropriate behaviour by an investigator, um, whether it be on a tape-recorded interview or when we went into an office, then that investigator would have a, dis a discussion. But I don't remember having to have a discussion in relation to a tape-recorded interview. And that's in the entirety of the seven years that you held a relevant role? In relation to tape recorded interviews, yes. I, did, I do remember speaking to an investigator about how they behaved when we went into an office one day to speak to the manager, but that was not to do with um, talking to a suspect. If um, a uh, member of the criminal law team decided that there was insufficient evidence to meet the test for prosecutions, would the file ever reach your desk? Yes. It would? I think so. And why do you think so? I think if there was a view that we needed to discuss the case with legal services, it might come back, it might come to me in order that I could have the discussion with legal services. Um, I, I, don't, I don't recall exactly whether the casework team had authority to close down an investigation if the case had been put forward for prosecution and the advice came back negative. Um, they may have done. I think, I do remember, I think, seeing some cases where they'd suggested that there was no value in prosecution, but the case came to me so I could have a discussion. Did you talk legal services or criminal law team around? No, I would just ask them the reasons. Did such cases end up in prosecutions? I don't think so. I don't remember having an argument that I won. And so um, you did see cases where there was an agreed insufficient evidence to prosecute? Yes. And what were the reasons for those? Can you remember? <sighs> the evidential insufficiency? I think, I think most of the time it was because there was a possibility that something else had occurred. So if there were poor procedures in an office and there was a counter loss and we couldn't ascribe the loss to an individual, an individual may well have been interviewed under caution and the case file gone to legal services for advice. But if they saw elements in the evidence that suggested that there was a risk to the prosecution because, say, other people had access to the till or the safe or whatever... A bit like then, Mr Blakey? Um, in poten potentially, yes. Yes. Where, as things stood at the date of the interview, there were six people. Yes. Um, him, his wife, and four counter staff. Yes. Who could equally have been responsible for the theft, but the interviewer was putting it on the basis of it must be Mr. Blakey. Yeah, I, I, 
I think there were other things in the papers and the report that suggested why he went down that line. Um, I can't recall them immediately, but I, I, I don't recall the case. Um, but looking at the papers, I think there was a, there were some reasons why they went down that road, um, but I can't recall what they were. If a criminal um, lawyer decided that there was sufficient evidence to prosecute, but that prosecution wasn't in the public interest, would the file reach your desk? Probably. Did you um, ever uh, overrule uh, such advice, i.e. you decide that the public interest test was met? Mm, I don't recall. It's unlikely. We may have had a frank discussion about it, but I, I doubt I would have overruled them. Uh, was cautioning a suspect a facility open to the post office? No. By that, I don't mean a criminal no, I, uh, caution preparatory to an interview. No, I know what you mean. But like a formal warning. I think if... I think... Well, we did have people cautioned, but I think... I don't remember if we did it in Post Office Limited, but I know if, with Royal Mail cases, if we'd had a postman arrested, or if... I, we may even administer a caution. I can't remember if we administered cautions or not, but I know that in Royal Mail cases with very minor theft cases or willful delay, we might have the police caution an offender, but I don't, I don't recall if we did it ourselves. Okay. Can I move to a new topic, please, which is um, the extent to which post office focused on debt recovery. Uh, you tell us um, in your witness statement um, that after you became National Investigations Manager, you also became a member of the Royal Mail Group Security Committee, which was comprised of the most senior and experienced security managers within Royal Mail. That's right, yes. Did the Royal Mail Group Security Committee exist for the entirety of your period as National Investigations Manager? <sighs> yes. I believe, uh, well, it may not have existed at the start, but it certainly existed when I stopped being involved in the investigations. What was the role and function of the Royal Mail Group Security Committee? Um, it was really around Andrew Wilson getting the most senior people together um, to discuss what was going on across the group and security and to make sure we were all aligned with where we were going and what corporate security was doing. How often did it meet? Uh, I can't recall. I think it might have been quarterly. Was it a formalised and minuted type committee? I think it was, but I can't remember. Were actions raised from it which required to be um, addressed following each meeting? <sighs> I, I really can't recall. I think I only... It can't have been in existence that long because I think I only went to about four or five. But we've seen from the November and December um, 2005 email agenda and minutes that um, issues were being raised at that stage as to the absence of a collective forum within um, the post office for addressing concerns that were being raised about the reliability of Horizon. Yes. Were those um, uh, concerns fed back to the Royal Mail Group Security Committee? I, I would imagine yes. But w would it not be the ideal forum for the provision or the exchange of information about um, concerns or allegations about problems with Horizon and concerns about the lack of facility and oversight within Post Office Limited for the management of uh, such allegations? I, I think it was, it was important, I think, that the committee was aware, but because Horizon was business unit specific, it was probably not the place to get action undertaken because this was just the security people from all the business units talking to Andrew Wilson and not Post Office Limited. It, it was much 
Andrew may have been a, a good person to use as a lever to get the business to do something, but he wasn't the person to take charge of that because he only dealt with security and criminal investigations. He didn't deal with business policy, the postmaster's contract, the discipline in relation to branches, uh, and he didn't have any involvement with Horizon. So I don't think he would have been the right person to do that, and that committee wouldn't have been the right place to deal with it. And just explain why. What, if there was a problem with um, Horizon, or an alleged problem with Horizon, um, which is fairly fundamental to the... Um, it is to the post office. To the post office. But not to Royal Mail Group, because the post office is a small part of Royal Mail Group, and Andrew's team was looking at the whole group. This is a business unit-specific issue, and therefore would be more properly dealt with within the business. Wouldn't you want to tell the group's um, security committee? I think I said that they were informed of it, but I don't think they took on ownership. And what do you mean by not, you don't think they took on ownership? I, don't, I think it was a business unit issue that was managed and owned within the business. So it was kept within Post Office Limited? I, I, honestly, I can only deal from the security perspective with, as far as security was concerned. I, I believe Andrew would have been aware, but he wouldn't have been actively involved. You tell us in your um, witness statement, it's paragraph seven, no need to um, turn it up, um, that you were um, responsible in your role for examining business processes, products, and identifying potential risks? Yes. Did, ever, uh, did that ever involve uh, the risk of Horizon not being robust? Uh, no. Did it ever involve identifying the risk not only to the um, safety and fairness of criminal convictions, but also to the um, continued operation of the Horizon system because of any bugs, errors, or defects within it? No. Who was responsible for that kind of big picture assessment of Horizon? I would have said the, the head of IT. And who was that at... Um, I, I, whilst you were National Investigations Manager? I'm not, I think it was Dave Smith, but I'm not 100% sure. But it's one thing for an IT system to have faults which have an impact on accounting. How do we return our annual accounts in um, truth and fairness each year? It's another if you're using that system um, in order to prosecute people, the data produced by that system to prosecute people, isn't it? I, I mean, I'm, an, I'm a layman, but I would say they're one and the same. If you can't trust the system, you can't trust your accounts and you can't choose the, va the data to prosecute people. I don't, think, I don't think there's any differential in that respect. It but either works or it doesn't, and if it's either fit for purpose for both purposes, or in my view, it's not. You don't think there's any um, difference between uh, relying on data for evidential purposes to prosecute somebody in a criminal court versus the checks and balances that you might apply from an accounting perspective? Um, again, I'm a layman. Um, I would imagine the, the charge on the prosecution is probably perhaps greater in respect of if you're producing a set of accounts and the auditors come in, there's probably a little bit of leeway as to whether they're 100% accurate or whether they're 100% checked, whereas if we're in prosecution, we need to be 100% certain of what we're saying. Did you rely in your mind on the fact that um, the auditors were auditing uh, Post Office Limited's annual accounts and therefore you took from that that Horizon must be robust and reliable. Regardless of the auditor function, the post office was using this to manage its business with its clients and the government, and of course I expected it to be 100% robust. It, it should have been, and we understood it was. And so the fact that auditors were um, performing a function for an accounting purpose didn't give you any added, you didn't rely on that in your, your mind? 
I, I don't think I, it's a long time, I don't remember what I relied on, but the fact that the business accounts were being signed off by auditors has, has obviously got to give us some confidence that what's in there is right. Did you know the, um, in fact, the extent to which the auditors examined the operation of Horizon, or whether they entered caveats in the accounts to say that they had not done so? I wouldn't be aware of, of anything of that nature. Uh, can we um, turn against the context of one of the answers you gave earlier about the um, introduction from, I think you said 2002, 2003 onwards, of a, a drive for financial investigations? Uh, I think it was 2003, 4. But 3, 4, yeah, okay. Yeah, I think so. Um, can we look please at poll 0012? One five two one, and if we just um, zoom out, please, uh, you'll see that these are um, criminal asset recovery security guidelines. Uh, version 2, dated 2003, and you're attributed co-authorship with um, M.F. Matthews. Yes. Um, they're said to be um, approved by Mick Matthews. What role did he perform? Um, I think... I think at this stage he was a commercial security manager, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, he later became a financial investigator. The, um, the owner is said to be Phil Gerrish. He was who, my predecessor. Your predecessor, uh, who was given assurance at the foot uh, of the page, and then they were authorised by the head of security. That would be Tony Marsh. Mr Marsh. Yes. Yeah. Uh, can we turn to page four, please? Can you see in the second paragraph, 1.2, uh, you and Mr. Matthews state, by recovering the assets, we send out a clear message to the criminal, potential criminal, there's little point in stealing as we will endeavour to recover their ill-gotten gains and, as such, reduce the benefit of their crime. This is a message the present government wish to send out as they are in the process of setting up the National Confiscation Agency, whose role it will be to remove assets from organised crime. What was the relationship between sub-postmasters and organised crime? Um, in the great scheme of things, it was rare. There were um, instances, particularly around this time, because we were still doing benefits by a book and cheque, organised crime would still um, benefit books in course of post and then uh, employ sub-postmasters to encash them. So um, we had cases where hundreds of thousands of pounds per year were being encashed of stolen benefit payments through sub-post offices. Uh, there was a particular case we did, we did the, with the DWP where there were a group of sub-postmasters who appeared to be working along the same lines, uh, who all knew each other and were all cashing stolen benefit books. And so here you're not talking about the species of um, alleged crime that we're concerned with in this inquiry? No. A postmaster prosecuted for allegedly stealing £2,000? Or... No, that, that's not, not, in that, not in that context, no. Uh, is what we read here a reflection of a, a new and more aggressive stance taken by the post office in financial investigations to send out a clear message to the criminals? Um, I don't think it was new. I think it was different, 
the legislation was new at that stage and we were looking at employing the legislation to make it easier for us to make recoveries in the case of a criminal trial. Were you generally of the view that um, if a uh, loss was shown at, um, a shortfall was shown at audit, there was likely to have been criminal activity? Was that your modus operandi? Um, I think you would go into the office with as an open mind as you could. Um, we were bearing... What, what, sorry, what was constraining you from having a completely open mind? experience of going into as many audit shortages as we did pre-Horizon and during Horizon where it wasn't, it wasn't um, anything other than a crime. And so that um, mindset might uh, colour the ability of an investigator to have an open mind? In practice, possibly. In, in, in theory, no. So in practice, which is what we're more concerned I with. I understand what you're saying. The difficulty is, is when, you, when you work in investigations and you, you get called out to the same thing 10 times and nine times, the first nine times a certain outcome is, is apparent. When you go in the 10th time, it's very hard to say, I'm not going to jump to that conclusion until I've seen the facts. I, you'd like to think that you would always keep an open mind on as you go in the door, but we're human beings. Isn't that uh, the function of senior management to ensure that its investigators remained impartial and independent and retained an open mind and in particular would pursue with diligence all reasonable lines of inquiry that pointed away from the guilt of the suspect? Yes. And how was that um, hammered home to investigators if so it was? Well, it would be, it, it was written in the policies that we had, it was written in the circulars that we had, uh, legal, legal services when they gave their advice and when they spoke to invest about, about cases would always be looking at what else is there. Um, team leaders in one-to-ones when they were looking at cases and how things were progressing would also be asking what else are we looking at, what else have we got. Um, it's just the nature of being an investigator is that you should pursue the avenues that you see as potentially giving you an answer that steers you in one direction or another. I mean, you said in an answer there that it was in the policies. That, um, we've seen evidence that the duty uh, under the Code of Practice issued uh, under the 1996 Act to pursue all reasonable lines of inquiry. Is this CPIA? Yes. yes. Um, didn't appear in post office policies for a decade. But every investigator from the time the act came into force had a copy and was told they had to abide by it. And so why wasn't it in policy for a decade? I, I think it was probably an omission on the basis that they had a copy of the act and they were expected to read the act and, uh, and abide by it. But um, having a copy of an act, some parts of which applied to a post office investigator other parts, many other parts of which did not. So there would have been... Um, it, it's not really a substitute, is it, for... It, it, may, it may not be. I, I believe that when CPA Act came in and we were looking at how to manage prosecutions on that basis, there would have been ID circulars to the effect of this is what the Act means for you. We're yet to discover those, but um, there was a your recollection is... There was a security intranet site, and all the policies and all the circulators were kept on it. And all the investigators would have received the circulate, circulars as they were published via an email. And so you would expect um, where a suspect raised a potential horizon cause of a shortfall to pursue with utter diligence every reasonable line of inquiry to see whether there was substance in that. Because if they've been told about it in their training, if they got a copy of the act and the guide in their hands, if it was on the intranet, they'd be under no doubt that that's what the law obliged them to do. I, I think you're, you're right, but I think you have to remember we were living in a world where if we got a statement from Fujitsu that said the computer system works correctly, then as far as we were concerned, that avenue was closed because there was no problem with the machine. 
as investigators, we would, ref we would always be reliant on a technical expert to tell us, because if I walked into court and said there was no problem with the horizon system, the judge would probably throw me out on the basis I didn't know what I was talking about. Uh, can we turn to a different topic that can come down? Thank you. Um, which is um, what Fujitsu told you and your relationship um, with um, Fujitsu. What was your relationship with um, Fujitsu like? Uh, personally, I didn't have much of one. Um, I did some work with them to help promote them with financial institutions once. Um, but I, I didn't have much of a relationship with Fujitsu at all. The relationship between us and them was very, um, it was strained in, in as much as they relied an awful lot on the contract and the commercial base of the, of the contract, which made it very difficult for us. Because when you're gathering evidence, you don't expect to be faced with a bill or a block to say you can't have that because it's not in the contract. So it was, we had to manoeuvre around the contract in order to get what we needed. Would you say that your team's relationship with Fujitsu was therefore strained? Yeah. Can we look please at poll 3090437? And turn to page 87, please. This is an email um, from you to John Cole and Keith Baines. Can you see that? Yep. Um, analyst resource for civil litigation cases. Um, you say, as discussed the other day, I do believe this is a job that could usefully be conducted with our team for a number of reasons, a positive stuff. Uh, our investigators routinely have to acquire and examine horizon transaction data as part of their criminal investigation and prosecution work, and are therefore familiar with not only looking at and analysing the data, but can also prepare their own witness statements in support of the evidence they uncover. Because we also have strong ties with the security and audit function within Fujitsu, we're also able to take witness statements from them in support of prosecution cases and could use the same links in support of civil matters. Um, I believe our contract states they will provide support in this area, etc., etc. and you go on. You're making a bid in this statement, I think, to take on the... Um, investigations for civil losses? I think that, that's, a, that, that's not quite how it was. It was a case you, of... You tell us. They, we'd agreed that somebody needed to do it, and it was identified that our team had people who could routinely look at root, um, data and, and see what was going on within the data. Uh, and had a relationship with Fujitsu, and I believe we were the only function that had that sort of relationship with the people that would be needed to write witness statements. So it was almost a case of, I wasn't necessarily keen to do it, but we were probably the right people uh, with the right level of experience to do it. Um, notwithstanding, I don't think civil law is quite the same as criminal law, so we would have had to do things slightly differently, I believe. And in those first couple of paragraphs, you're pointing at um, strong ties or good links it says with Fujitsu. Stuff. Yeah. I think there was probably a bit that said negative stuff. Yes, we're going to go on to that in, in, in a moment. But this doesn't identify issues or problems with Fujitsu. Um, given the recipients of that email, I don't think this was necessarily the place to put that. Why? Because Keith Baines knew that we had issues. So he knew it already? I believe he did, yes. Can we scroll down, please? Um, to the sting in the tail. Um, it needs to be understood that as the people running the system and, and its diagnostics, only Fujitsu can provide evidence the system's working correctly. All we can do is look at transactions, identify the dodgy ones, 
and provide some idea of what's gone on and who did it. So you might find that there has to be a lot of input from Fujitsu on this, um, from a witness statement of court attendance aspect. I've spoken to Rod about this issue, and as we're in the throes of a 20% reduction, unless I'm able to keep two of the CM2 heads, is that a, a reference to a grade of investigator? That's the investigation standard grade, yes. Um, then I'm able, that I'm able to lose, I'm asked to lose, I'll not be in a position to undertake this work. I've asked Rod to speak to Peter Corbett about this and see at where we stand. But you weren't identifying in this um, the kind of difficult or strange relationship you pointed. Uh, I don't pointed us to. I think this was something different to that day-to-day -day working with relationship with Fujitsu. This is about whether we were in a position where we could set some bodies in place to help with the civil litigation side of the business. Um, the, having had discussions with Keith Baines about, and it was probably more than my team than myself, the experience, the difficulties around the contract and getting information. Uh, I don't know, I can't remember if it mentions in this email or elsewhere that all the time we were constrained by the number of requests that we were allowed to have, we'd either have to reduce the number of requests in prosecutions in order to enable some requests for civil litigation or find some other means of, of using the data. So there was a lot more than, than just this email. It, it, was a, it was a bit of a discussion. Okay, let's turn then to, um, that can come down, the um, requests made for data from Fujitsu. You tell us in paragraph 34 of your witness statement that your role was to try and persuade the business leaders that you needed better access to data in order to carry out our investigation activity as the decrease um, meant that investigators had to be more mindful of how much data they requested. And it meant that with the investigations we had ongoing, we struggled to get access to sufficient data in a timely fashion. Is that right? Yes. Does it follow then that commercial considerations had a significant impact on the work of the investigators? Uh, I would say probably it would depend on how you looked at it. If you look at what happened as a result of commercial decisions, yes, because we didn't investigate as many things because we had less investigators. And the constraints on ARQ requests meant that sometimes we had to wait till the following month before we could make a request because we'd run out. Uh, and, and I think we did put a proposition together that said how many investigations we thought we'd be able to undertake based on the ARQ data. Did it have an impact, i.e. commercial considerations, did that have an impact on investigations that you did commence? Um, I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I, it would be hard to say. I don't, I don't think we ever had to close a case because we couldn't provide the evidence. But listening to what's gone on in the years since, there's we probably needed more data than we had. In the event that the ARQ request limit was reached, what impact would that have on a particular investigation? It would have to wait until the next door opened and we could get some more. So investigators might pause their investigations and wait to the following month or yes. um, two months or however long. It was usually, a, I don't think we ever rolled over two months. Was the request to increase the um, availability of data that you made to senior leaders within the post office turned down on the basis of cost? I don't recall. I don't recall. I think there was something being built within the business at the time called Polmiz. Um, oh, sorry? It was called Polmiz. I think it was Post Office Limited Management Information System. And there was a lot of data being shared by Fujitsu straight into that repository and I think we had a business objects front end so we could do some data analysis ourselves before going for ARQ but I think it came in towards the end of my time and I'm not entirely sure what we did and how we used it but I know business objects was a front end and we could do some analysis via that that route. Did um, you have to adopt a position you and your members of your team in avoiding making requests for data so that limits 
were not reached? Um, I think we probably sent out instructions to people to be mindful of what they asked for um, and to ensure that they only asked for ARQ data where they considered there to be a need for it rather than using the data they picked up from the um, offices when they visited. Can we look please at poll 0011 4566? And page 31, please. And if we can um, look at the email that starts halfway down the page. Thank you. There's an email uh, from you to John Cole, Graham Ward, and Tony Marsh with the subject Horizon Data Requests. And you say, as discussed, we're looking at achieving 50 requests per month for the remainder of the year at present, end of December. From what you were saying, potentially end of March, can you just confirm that the incremental step process is the only avenue open to us? We'll have the required request numbers using this process. If you could give us the exact figures, it would be most helpful, as we will use whatever requests are available. As you can imagine, with the change taking place in the business at present, so changes taking place in the business at present, we are in increasing need of horizon data and are still avoiding asking for it wherever possible in order to preserve our requests. This means we will inevitably be looking for further increased access in due course and I'll be preparing a blueprint to gain access in the next few weeks. Firstly, what changes in the business were you referring to at this point in July 2004? So look, we, we were coming to the end of legacy cases that didn't involve Horizon and some of the fraud types where Horizon data was far less important um, and more and more of what we were doing was because Horizon was, was across the whole network and everything we looked at involved Horizon. More and more cases were going to require Horizon data. Um, and, and we were still in the throes of learning about data and how data was useful in investigations. So our, our, our view was that as time passed and more and more things happened in post office and the business changed, um, we would need more and more data in order to back up the evidential value of our prosecutions. This refers to avoiding asking for it wherever possible. Was that an instruction that all of the members of your team knew about? Avoid asking for ARQ data if at all possible. So when we're um, talking to investigators, it's very different to talking to these guys. So the investigators were told that you ask for ARQ data if, it's, if you require it, um, but if you can use the data that you've picked up from the offices, because we would pick up a month's worth of horizon transaction and event logs from the offices when we visited, so I wouldn't be expecting an investigator to ask for ARQ data for that month if he'd got printouts that had all the information on, albeit using a printer, uh, a printed report that might be seven foot long is a lot harder than using a, an Excel spreadsheet on a computer disk. Hold on though, this says your investigators are still avoiding asking for it wherever possible. So that's me talking to the business, not what I'm telling to the investigators to do. So was that not the truth then? So they're, they're asking, they're, they're avoiding it wherever possible, but what, what I'm saying to the investigators, if you need it, you've still got to ask for it, which is why we were rolling in for requests over month by month. But if um, the investigators were told, if you need it, go and get it, there's no problem. So if, if you've got an investigator investigating a, uh, an audit shortage or any other type of fraud at the, the office, the tendency would be, right, let me get a month's worth of ARQ data and have a look. If, you, if, if in the view of the investigator they're doing that for the sake of doing it, then don't ask for the ARQ data. Use the month's reports that you've got from the office. I'm just trying to manage my resource and what I've got access to. Were you aware of Postmasters querying Horizon's accuracy or raising Horizon cause discrepancies with the MBSC and the help desk at this time? 
only where it was mentioned in a criminal investigation. There was no there was no sort of business alert system that said we've had 15 calls about this this week and 17 about that last week. Uh, that that sort of information exchange didn't exist. Um, if a postmaster did not raise calls that they had made to MBSC or the help desk, was that uh, material um, sought from either MBSC or the help desk? I believe as part of the evidence gathering that investigators would look at calls to the help desk. They may, if, if it was an investigation... Even if the suspect hadn't raised it? I, I can't comment on every single case. I didn't see every single case. I, I think if there was an investigation going on before the audit took place, calls to the help desk would probably have been analysed before they went into the office. With an audit shortage, it's, it's very much a snapshot. So whether they would then look, I don't know. If either because the postmaster had raised um, the number of and nature of calls that they had made to MBSE or the help desk, or because the investigator, as a matter of routine, had sought such data from MBSE or the help desk, if there were a series of calls where the postmaster was complaining about the operation of Horizon, uh, would the investigator seek ARQ data relating to the events described by the postmaster? Ordinarily, I think, they, yes, they would. Would this kind of avoiding asking for it wherever possible... That would be an exclusion. Th that, wouldn't, that wouldn't act as a break or a prohibition on them getting it? No. We can see um, at the foot of the page there... Thank you. That your email is a reply to Mr. Ward's um, email of 12.36, setting out the number of ARQ requests. So it's not a reply to Graham's email. Graham, Sorry? I'd ask Graham for that information in order that I could go to John Cole with it. It wasn't me replying to Graham. It was Graham providing information. For okay, so if we just scroll up, sorry. You, so I emailed forward, John you Cole. forward it to Mr. Cole and you copy So Graham. I copied Graham in and I copied in Tony Marsh because obviously I was talking to Tony about it. And why do you do that? Why are you copying Mr. Marsh in? Because I might need his um, influence later on if I needed to argue more strongly with the business that I wasn't getting what I wanted. So his heft, essentially? Yes. Uh, if we just scroll down then to see what Mr. Ward had told you. Um, this year we've submitted the following. This is 2004. And he totals them up and says, with a projection of 20 for August, 330, um, our annual limit. If we just scroll over the page. Predicting how many we will want isn't straightforward. As people in our own team, um, RLMs, MBSC legal services, are aware of the problems and restrictions in obtaining these logs and thus don't bother um, asking for them. Uh, just stopping there, what do you understand him to mean that retail line managers, the network um, support centre and legal services don't bother asking for ARQ data. That's, that's what he's saying, yes. Is that because the investigators were taking up the allocation and more than the allocation? Yes. If we had greater access, I'm sure that once the word got around, we'd use up whatever was available. I think it's a bit like building a motorway. Just explain what you mean by that. You build a motorway, people fill it up with cars. That said, with a monthly limit of 46, I didn't have to turn many away. So I guess that having 50 per month for the rest of the year would see us through until the contract's amended. My guesstimate for the remaining year would be 220. And he um, explains why. D did you understand Mr Ward to be informing you that 
some requests for ARQ data were actually being turned away? Um, or not I being made? I don't know that he, we actually turned them away. I think if an RLM or MBSC wanted um, data, they were probably more cautious about asking for it. A bit like the investigators, if you don't really need this, don't ask for it because we, 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 we can't get it. Why would legal services be asking, ideally, for ARQ data? I think that would probably apply to the civil litigation side because the prosecution side would never ask for data. They would ask us to get it. They would ask us to ask for it. Why would retail line managers be asking for ARQ data? I really don't know. Unless they were doing an investigation into something that happened in a branch that they were trying to find help and provide support for. Why would the NBSC be asking for ARQ data? I don't know. Probably a similar reason to the RLM. I mean, this reads as if there's a, an otherwise legitimate need for them in each of their capacities to seek such data, but they don't bother asking because they know they won't get. I think you could probably argue that. In investigations, in criminal investigations, was a request for ARQ data um, delayed until a case had um, reached the Crown Court and plea was known? I, I don't think so. It may depend on the case, but I, I don't think so, because if, if, if the investigator considered the content of the ARQ data to be material in whether we should prosecute or not, then we wouldn't wait to charge somebody and then go back and say, actually, this was a mistake, let's not bother. What about not asking for the ARQ data in anticipation that you might get a plea, for example, to false accounting? <sighs> Again, if, if, if the ARQ data was material to the case, then I would have expected to look at it first. You would have expected the investigator to have looked at it first? Yeah. But this um, financial constraint was... It's not a perfect world. They may well have taken the view that we'll put the case to legal services and if we prosecute and they plead, we've saved the request. The, the investigators and concert themselves weren't responsible for managing the request. That was done by a casework. So I don't, I don't think investigators, when they're looking at a case initially, would consider the ARQ requests in that way, other than the fact that they were told, unless you really need this, don't ask for it. Uh, can we go to page 35, please? And scroll down, please. Can we see your email of the 8th of July to Keith Baines, again copied to Tony Marsh, but I think with Dave Pardo added in? Yep. Uh, please see email below from Tony Marsh. Can you please give an update to what activity has been undertaken with regard to gaining direct, direct access to Horizon data for use within the business? I believe Tony raised the idea of having our own access to the audit data from within the business via a terminal via which we would be able to obtain data for all parts of the business and remove the need for us to make data requests for, for Fujitsu. Um, and then next paragraph... This issue has become in, uh, considerably more important recently as investigators are finding it increasingly difficult to pursue criminal cases without having access to audit data. Defence teams have also identified this as a means of delaying and in some cases potentially ceasing prosecution activities. As you can see from Tony's email, this has meant we've had to increase our use of audit requests to a point that we will run out at the end of August with potentially serious consequences thereafter and then you make the point that paper-based cases are, are, are a dwindling um, number it's apparent from this escalation this reminder this request for an update that you were finding it difficult to obtain approval from post office executives to increase the ARQ data allowance yes from recollection Did this financial constraint on securing data that was essential one way or another to the viability and fairness of a prosecution continue? 
Um, I think it, it was always an issue for us. And did that continue until the end of your days in the post office? I believe so. Uh, Mr. Utting, thank you very much. They're the only questions that I ask you for the moment. Um, I think there are some questions. No. Yes, one set of questions. And then somebody wants to speak to me. So I'll let um, Mr. Jacobs ask questions first, sir, uh, on behalf of the Howe and Co. core participants. Thank you. Um, Mr. Utting, um, we act for 156 sub postmasters, including Suzanne Palmer, who sits next to me to my left today. Um, you deal with Mrs. Palmer at paragraphs 49 to 52 of your statement. Do you recall? Um, I recall I've read some papers and I think I was under prosecution authority. Yes. Right, yes. And what you say is, um, and I'll read it to you, um, I was not aware that Suzanne Palmer had made any allegations about the functioning of the Horizon system and none of, and none of the documents disclosed to me suggest that she did. Now, Mrs. Palmer... Um, it did raise allegations about the functioning of the Horizon system from the very outset of Post Office's investigation into her case. An investigating officer at Post Office who interviewed her, um, Miss uh, Lisa Allen, yes. um, who interviewed her in February 2006, she's given a witness statement to the inquiry in which she confirms that Mrs. Palmer did raise Horizon issues at the interview. Right. So what I uh, wanted to ask you um, is, given that it seems to be accepted by the investigating officer and by my client, do you accept that what you say in your statement is incorrect when you're saying that you don't think she raised any horizon issues? It might be, but I haven't seen any documents to the contrary. OK, so. all right. So if someone who conducted the interview and, uh, and, and reads back that interview says that she, that she did, then that's, that's, that's fine. Yeah, I'll accept. OK, good. I just wanted to clear that up. Um, now, um, there is no evidence um, that the horizon issues that Mrs. Palmer raised, and she said um, that um, the system went down, causing losses, which she had to repay, and there were other issues when the system went offline. She says that horizon generated error notices. She didn't agree with those. There's no, issue, there's no evidence um, that um, that was ever investigated by a post office. Um, certainly no ARQ requests. As the designated prosecution authority, which you were, is this something that you would have been made aware of? Would you have known this is a sub-postmaster who's raised horizon issues, if, but we haven't investigated? If it was in the investigation report, then I would have been aware. Um, I, I, honestly, I, I, did, I have read the investigation report, but I've got 2,000 pages. Of course. Um, if, if it was in the report that Miss Palmer had raised issues around the horizon, then I would have been aware that she'd raised them. Um, as I don't think it was in there, no. the fact that the ARQ wasn't asked for would have probably not mattered to me because they hadn't mentioned it. I, I, would, I've, I don't know if they can put the investigation report up on the screen and so I can look at it, but I, I don't know. Well, we haven't got it now and we're a bit short of time, but right. um, what I wanted to ask you is do you think that this is something that should have been in the case summary and legal advice that was given to you as a designated authority? If, if it's material, yes. Now, um, you told Mr Beer this afternoon that you never said no to a prosecution. Uh, I don't believe I did, no. And um, you said, I don't recall saying no, they were the experts and they would give the advice. Um, essentially... If we could just break that down, what you're saying is that if a sub postmaster raised a horizon issue and that horizon issue had not been investigated, but the legal advice that you received in your papers was to prosecute, you would have authorised it anyway because they're the experts. They would have had the same information as me, so they wouldn't have been aware either. So they would have advised prosecution and, and yes, I would have authorised it. So, is it right that you took the view that you were a layman and it wasn't your place to disagree with the experts? In majority of cases, yes. Because in Mrs. Palmer's case, there wasn't an investigation and these points weren't raised in the report. They weren't looked at by the post office. I, I, I can't comment. Okay. Um, and 
you're here today obviously because there's been a, a national scandal. With the benefit of hindsight, do you accept that the prosecution authority role didn't really provide any scrutiny or oversight, that it was just a, a rubber stamp exercise? Um, as I said to Mr Beer earlier on, you can see it that way. I'm not sure that, that I did. I did read all the papers. I did have a view. But you never, you never ch uh, challenged what you were being told. You, you didn't see yourself as a filter. You just endorsed. I saw it. myself as the person in the business that had to make the ultimate decision. And if I read the papers and the advice and couldn't find a reason to disagree with it, then I would have authorised the prosecution. Okay. Um, if I could move on. Um, in your evidence this morning, you said that when the post office lost a case, there would be a report written by counsel. Yes. which goes to the criminal law team and then to the leadership team. Is that right? I believe so, yes. And I want to ask you about that process in relation to Mrs. Palmer's case. Um, in January 2007, at South End Crown Court, Mrs. Palmer was acquitted by a jury, and they took approximately 10 minutes to acquit her. Um, the jury asked a question, um, which was, what was Mrs. Palmer supposed to do if she didn't agree with the figures that the Horizon system produced? So what we've got is not only Mrs. Palmer, but um, the jury um, raising this question about the Horizon system. And the post office representatives at court were not able to answer the question. They were publicly floundering, something of a car crash. Do you think that this is the sort of case that there should have been a review? Yes. And were you aware, having been the prosecuting authority, were you aware of any review being conducted or having been conducted? I don't know. You say January 2007? January 2007. That was shortly before I left, so any review may not have come through until after I'd gone. However, the question that was asked at court, I can't understand why the person or the representative, I don't know who was there from the post office, but the answer to the question should have been you declare it um, and then you argue your toss with the business. Well, we're going, to, that's the process. we're going to ask questions of the post office investigator who was present at court. But, but, the, but the post office were not able to answer that yeah. question, and the jury acquitted her of all counts in 10 minutes. And you've said that you think that is something that ought to have been the subject of a review. I, 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 I haven't done this for 17 years, no. but in my, in my view, yes, there should have been a review. Well, that's helpful. And, and, and finally... This was 2007. If, as designated prosecution authority, you, you could have, had continued in that role, or others had uh, done so in 2008 and 2009, and there had been a review of Mrs. Palmer's case, um, and um, the, uh, it, it was known amongst your colleagues that jurors were raising questions and acquitting um, because the post office was simply not able to deal with horizon issues where sub post masters had raised them um, and where there hadn't been in proper investigations. Would that have influenced your role and your job as a prosecuting authority? Would that have caused you or your colleagues to question what the uh, advice you, that, you, that so, you had so, received was? So I'm sitting here with the benefit of hindsight. Yes, and of, course. of course. I'm going to say, of course it would. Well, good. But <laughs> But yes. But I, 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 I don't live in that world anymore. I, it's a long time since I was involved in those things, and the post office is a very different place, and it was a very different place when I left to what it was when I joined. But I'd like to think as the person in charge of the investigation team, and, and I considered my investigators to be very professional and to be doing a good job, I'd like to think that we learnt from issues like this and we moved forward mm. with, with better information and better understanding. But I left in 2007. What, uh, what people did after I left is really of no concern to me. Well, what you said is helpful, and you have acknowledged that this is something that should have been dealt with. I think so, yes. Okay. I'm just going to see if I have any more questions. Before. Yes, I'm just going to ask you, um, Mrs. Palmer was made bankrupt as a result of this. She's still bankrupt today. Do you, uh, as you played a role in her case, have anything that you would like to say to her? Uh, when, when we did the job, we, we, we acted in what we thought was the right manner and pursued the case as professionally as we were able at the time. 
um, you're one of a, a number of people that have got off on the wrong end of this and, and it's embarrassing for me to, to be part of the organisation that did that to you and, and for that I am sorry uh, but I'm not sure that what I say is going to help you at all because it's of not much value is it to be honest. Thank you, I haven't any further questions for you. Any other questions? Um, yes, sir, from me, please. Um, Mr. Rutting, I also appear for a group of sub-postmasters, including Mrs. Adedayo and also Ms. Skinner. The questions I'm going to ask you relate to the case of Janet Skinner, and um, it's relating to a discussion which was had between you and the lawyer who was the lawyer looking after her case, who seems to have spoken to you in your role as somebody who authorises and um, allows charges to go ahead. If we could bring up poll 3048397, please. When it comes up, you'll see this is a phone note, and um, it's relatively short, so we can go through it. It says that it relates to... Janet Skinner's case, which is in Hull Crown Court on the 5th of January. And if we scroll down a little bit, we'll see that this note is actually made on the 5th of January. So uh, evidently, it was, the case was in court on this date. And what it tells us is that J. McF, uh, we know from other documents, Juliet McFarlane, made this note. And she says, at first, she spoke to prosecution counsel, who had added false accounting to the indictment. And she says that will be faxed over and the indictment is lodged at court. The defence wished to plead to false accounting. Loss not repaid. Counsel has drafted false accounting in such a way that, in her opinion, there should not be a problem with the confiscation proceedings. Then she says this. Telephone Tony Utting, re-acceptance of plea to false accounting, gave details of background to this case. And just pausing there, that suggests, doesn't it, that you were needed in order to approve the decision to accept pleas to false accounting. Is that right? I believe so, yes. I, I believe that the, the lawyers um, were not able to make those decisions for themselves. They just needed, for want of a better description, the rubber stamp from the business. All right, so she's running that past you. And then she goes on to say this, um, gave details of background to this case and other thief at office would accept false accounting in absence of contrary instructions. What we know from other papers is that there was a temporary sub-postmaster who came after Ms Skinner, and she was also arrested for theft. I believe she was a member of staff at the office while Mrs Skinner was there. She had been a member of staff, and then subsequently she became a temporary sub-postmaster. Yes, I recall that much from the papers. So you recall that much. Now... Um, in this note, it appears as if that's being presented as a good reason to accept the lesser charge of false accounting, yes? Because it undermines the case against Miss Skinner. Yes. So it seems that both you and Miss McFarlane recognised that as a, a feature that undermined the prosecution case. Yes. And so what it... Was, what is jumping out at you about that? What, what ought to happen with information that undermines the prosecution case? Uh, I'm not sure, because we're at plea at this stage, so yes. I, I wouldn't be, I'm not an expert in anything in that area, but if we've gone to court and the defence have said the false accounting we can accept because she admits that she was falsifying the account, but she didn't steal the money and we had a, a, a risk to the prosecution on the basis that a person who worked at the same time as her was subsequently arrested for theft, then obviously prosecution for theft is not necessarily a great idea. But if, if she's admitting to the false accounting and we think we can prove the false accounting, then, then we would accept it. Do you see that as disclosable? Well, we're stood in the Crown Court. This, this was a telephone call at Crown Court, so it would be disclosable at that point. The information about the other thief at the office, was that disclosable information in your view? Yes. Yes. 
I'm not sure from this document whether it was disclosed or not. Did you say anything about making sure it was disclosed? Well, it was, we're, stu we're stood in a Crown Court. It's a bit, bit late now. The defence knows. Well, let's just understand that. Are you saying it's a bit late because you didn't think it was disclosable once pleas were offered? No, I think... I, I don't know if it was disclosed. I didn't see... Once I've authorised the prosecution, I don't have any further involvement with the case unless I get a telephone call such as this. At that point, I still wouldn't know if it was disclosed. I was having a discussion with a solicitor based on some information she was giving me and, and, and accepting a lesser charge. My involvement went no, no further than that. So you didn't see it as part of your role as somebody in charge of investigators to make sure that this is something that was disclosed to the defence? I, like, like I've said, I don't know if it was disclosed to the defence at that stage. I don't know from this document who was, who was talking to who about what. All I know is that she rang me and said, there's a background to the case. If there's a background to the case and they already knew about the thief at the office, then my view would be that should have been disclosed. From recollection, you did not make sure it was disclosed? I don't think that I would need to make sure when we're stood accepting a plea. If it transpires, as I believe it will from the documents we've had so far, that it was not disclosed, do you recognise that as a pretty clear and terrible disclosure failing? If, if they knew about the thief in the office and the other person had been arrested prior to the case going to trial, yes. Thank you. Those are my questions, sir. Thank you, Ms Page. Sir, there are no other questions. Thank you. Um, well, thank you for providing your witness statement and thank you for answering a good many questions during the course of today, Mr. Rapping. I'm grateful to you. Um, Wednesday next, is that right, Mr. Beer? Yeah? Wednesday, yes, it is. Um, it's sometimes difficult to remember which yeah. day of the week it is, um, but uh, Wednesday is our next appearance. All right, I'll see you all at 10 o'clock on Wednesday morning. Thank you very much, sir.